goal, my one goal here today is just to be with Jesus. Amen. If you're with me, can you just lift up your hands all over the room? Father, we just say to you, we are coming. Jesus, we are coming after you. We are chasing you, Jesus. We are chasing your presence. We're not just chasing your miracles or your favor or your blessings. We're not just chasing you because we just want, we just got nothing else to do. No, no. We want the presence of God here. I want the presence of God in my life. I need more of you, Jesus. I am zero laser focused on getting more of you, God. That is all I want to do today. And if you're with me in the room, let's give a giant amen. One, two, three. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Wow. Can you tell this amazing worship team how much you love them? Can you give them, come on, tell them, thank you, thank you, thank you. Return to your seats, but don't get too comfortable. Go ahead and remain standing. Act, uh, excuse me, John chapter 17. We got some scripture for you today. I'm just telling you, God is about to do something in this place. You've been hoping and searching and believing and praying for a breakthrough. You didn't know this, but today's your breakthrough day. You didn't know this, but God had a plan for your life for today. Grab your Bibles, John chapter 17. If you don't have your Bible with you, we're not mad at you. We, we don't look at you any different. We know you got your phone. We know you got your phone Bible with you. We know that you, maybe some of you don't even have a Bible. This is your first time at Lighthouse, and you've never stepped foot in a church before. Some of you might be here. We just say to you, you're welcome here anytime. You come on. Come on with it. Come on. We got the scriptures up on the screen for you to, to read. Before I begin that scripture, I just got to say I spent this last week at one of my favorite places on the planet, Lake Placid Conference Center. We, we had a 50 lighthouse people, 38 of them were under this height because they were kids. And we had 12 leaders from our church there with us. And we just had a great time going after Jesus at kids camp. And so many of our parents, they came, uh, they, they've been calling me, they've been telling me uh, two things. Number one, my kid is so tired and they have no voice. And thank you so much. They took a nap when they got off the bus and they can't talk very loud and they're just honked. So thank you for that ministry. And then the other thing they say is they say something has changed about them. God has done something in their hearts. And we say praise the Lord. Amen. Come on. It's awesome. Many of our kids team were there. They're still serving today. Some of the kids team are in the room that went with us. If you were there or if you served, I just want to say thank you. Mr. Don drove them and picked them up. Miss Sandy got them there. We just say thank you to all of you who helped with that. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Do me a favor. Parents, when you go pick up your kids today from the Lighthouse Kids area, we just tell those that team over there, just tell them thank you for going the extra mile this week. In fact, can we just make that a regular practice? When you pick up your kids from the nursery, when you pick up your middle school or junior high kid or high school kid, can you just look at Pastor Connor Kaylee and just say thank you for what you do? Can we just make that a regular practice in our church? I think that's a good plan, yeah? John chapter 17. This is Jesus. He's praying. It's, his prayer is recorded. And this is what he says in verse 20. He says, I do not pray for these alone but also those who will believe in me through their word, that they will all be one, say one, as you, Father, are in me and I are in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me and that they may be made perfect in one say one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me today we're going to begin a series of messages and thoughts on this idea of unity and I want to title this message that God has for you when your breakthrough requires an army. When your breakthrough requires an army. I know we pray, but let me pray one more time over this word. Father, I thank you that your word is alive and active. It's sharp, Lord. 
is sharper than any two-edged sword. It separates our soul and our body. It, it, it pierces into our spirit. It, it penetrates into our hearts, God. Allow this word that you have placed in my heart now be placed in the heart of your great people here. Lord, I pray that if there's any of my word that wants to sneak its way, if there's any of my opinions or thoughts that want to sneak its way into the God's word, I pray that would be gone today. We don't want to hear from me. We want to hear from you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Turn to three people and say amen. God bless them. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. You may grab a seat. Thank you, Tyler. God bless you. God bless you. You may be seated. We're so grateful to see you today. It is a great day to be in God's house. Thank you for worshiping with us. I'm so excited. As you know, this year we have been pursuing the greater. We have been believing for the greater. We have not been satisfied with what God has done in our life. We refuse to be satisfied with just mediocre or just good enough or just okay. But we are looking for the greater. Amen. I want to have a greater life. I want to have a greater marriage. I want to be a greater husband. I want to be a, I was going to say greater wife, but that doesn't apply here. I want my wife to be greater. Don't tell her I said that. She's with the kids today. I want to have a greater ministry. I, I, I want my life to go after the greater. I want to be the type of person that goes after the greater. You've heard this time and time again this year, but we are believing and we are hungry and we are seeking the greater things of God. Amen. Not just the greater in my life, but I want our church to be greater. God has done great things in Lighthouse. We are so grateful for the years of faithful ministry from our legacy pastors. Can you tell them how much you love them? Our legacy pastors in the room. Come on. We are grateful for the years of ministry. We are grateful for what God is doing. We are grateful that we are part of a great church, but there is nothing that we are doing that God is not calling us to do at a greater level. Amen. Greater level, more souls saved, more people coming to the kingdom, more people supported, more ministry to the next gen, more worship, more prayer. Everything that we do, God is calling us to the next level. He is calling us to be a part of a great church. Amen. We are looking for the greater. We are hungry for the greater. We are not satisfied with just the okay, but we are hungry for the greater. So over the next several weeks, as I said, we're going to be looking at the secret weapon for the greater church. What is the secret sauce for the church that is greater? What is, what is the church that is great? What do they have that other churches don't have? There are great churches all over this nation. There are churches that are making big impacts. Lighthouse is one of those churches. Amen. Those churches that are making the most impact, those people that are doing the most for God, those, those people that are, are, are making a difference in their community, they have one thing in common. They have one thing that they have a secret sauce. It is what keeps them moving forward and what keeps their impact great. And that thing that they have is what we're going to be talking about. And the word is unity. Say unity. Yeah. Now let's say unity in unison. One, two, three. A, B, go. <laughs> I tried to trick you. The enemy tries to trick us and he tries to get us to have division in our churches. But God is calling us to unity in our church. You know what the difference is between division? You know what the word division means? The word division is the word die, like uh, to divide. The, the word division means multiple visions. Instead of vision, which is one vision, Division is multiple visions. We, we have multiple ideas of what church is. We have multiple things going. There, there, there is not a unity in the vision. And so now what do we have? We have division. We have division. And so what the Lord is calling not just our church, but the capital C church, all the churches, is to come under this powerful idea of unity. So we, as you can see on our banners now today, starting today, we are going to be believing and striving and searching for greater unity. Amen. This is what John chapter 17 is all about. Think about this. <coughs> Think about this. This is Jesus's, one of Jesus' last recorded prayers in all of Scripture. This is right before he passes away. This is right before he gets crucified. 
before he comes back. And what is Jesus praying for? What is Jesus believing for? There is one thing that Jesus is praying for in John chapter 17. Go back and read the whole thing if you have time. Don't do it during my message. Please. John chapter 17 records Jesus' prayer. He is saying, Jesus, now he's not saying Jesus because he is Jesus. He's saying, Father, here's what we need to pray for. Do you know that Jesus is praying for you when he prays this? You are recorded in Scripture. You may not know that. You may just think you were forgotten, but you are recorded in Scripture. You are recorded. Your name may not be in Scripture, but you are recorded. Jesus says, I'm not only praying for the 12 disciples, my group, my group, my gathering that I have here today. I'm not just praying for that, but what does he say? I'm praying for all future believers who will believe the message from these who are here now. How many are a believer? How many are in the future from when Jesus said this? You are a future believer. That is who Jesus is praying for. Jesus was praying for you. And what is he praying? He prayed that they would be one, that they would have unity, that they would come together, that there would be one vision, that they would be in one. Just like, Father, you and I are together, just like I listen to you and you listen to me and, and, and we are in this together and I can lean on you and you can lean and you lean on me and you help me. Just like that, God, may they be like that. May they be that way. And do you know the Bible records what Jesus is doing now? We get this wrong sometimes because as kids we say things like, Jesus, how many want to ask Jesus into their heart? And that's great. And we, we understand that, but but what that actually means is the Holy Spirit comes into our life. When we ask God to come into our heart, be the Lord of my life, the Holy Spirit takes residence in your spirit. The Bible makes it very clear what Jesus is doing right now. It says he is interceding for you. He is praying for you. I just, and I'm just a big believer that what Jesus prayed for before he was crucified is probably the same prayers he's praying now. Jesus, Father, help them to be in unity. Help them to be in one accord in Jesus' name. Amen. This is what God has been praying for. Unity is important in God's word. Let me give you some scripture. Write these down. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Say rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Say one mind. Live in peace. Say peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. I don't know about you, but I believe we are in a nation that is hungry. They don't even know how hungry they are, but we are people who need peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Peace. Acts 4.32. All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. Galatians 3.28. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ. Say one. Acts 1.14, they all met together and were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. They all met together and constantly united in prayer. John 13, 35, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples by how? How will they know? How, how are you distinguished from everybody else, from every other culture? How will people know that your life is separated from everybody else? How is this accomplished? By the way that you love one another. By your love. You are united. You are united. Unity is important in God's word. Unity is important. Say unity. Let's say unity together. One, two, three. <laughs> unity is important in God's kingdom. The enemy knows what God can do with a church that is united. In the book of Acts, this was a very dangerous time for God's people. This was a very dangerous time for God's church. It could have gone one way or the other. They could have either... 
picked up the mantle that Jesus had called them to, the Great Commission, and moved the gospel mission down the road, or they could have let fear stop them from doing what God has called them to do. This is where we read scriptures about how they locked themselves in the house and they were afraid of, of uh, what, what was going to happen. Jesus showed up among them and said, be filled of the Holy Spirit. Have courage. Be at peace. This was a dangerous time for the church of God. This was dangerous time. This thing was either going to just, just be finished because of fear or it was going to move forward. Here's two things that happened that caused God's mission to move forward in spite of this dangerous season. Number one was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, Micah. It makes a difference, doesn't it? Man, I love this girl up worshiping. It gets me every time. I'm glad they put her on the far side because if she was in front of me, I would just sit there and sob. I just, thank you, Lord. It's amazing what the Holy Spirit can do. The Holy, can, Holy Spirit can take a bunch of disciples who are scared, put them in a room, and then you add the Holy Spirit to the mix, and they come out mighty warriors for Jesus. Amen. So that was the first secret sauce they had was the Holy Spirit. The second secret sauce they had, you try to say secret sauce. Secret sauce, secret sauce, secret sauce, secret sauce. That, I'm impressed by myself sometimes, sorry. I had prepared to mess that up. I was going to insert joke when I messed up secret sauce, but I got it right. And instead of playing it cool and just going on, I had to acknowledge myself. Sorry. The secret secret sauce that they had was unity. They had the Holy Spirit, and they had unity. They started pulling all their resources. They said, I'll sell my house, and that way we can use the money to help feed those that are hungry. I'll get rid of this. We can all meet at my place. We'll supply this. We'll pull our resources. We'll just, y'all come and live with us. Y'all come and just stay at our place. We'll just sell that. We'll just sell that property. We'll just, we'll just move all this around. We've got one vision now. There's, a, there's not multiple who's going to be uh, uh, sitting at the right hand. Who's, where are all of we going to, where are we going to stack up in the kingdom of God when it comes? No, no, all of that is behind us now. We just got one zero laser focused vision ahead. We need to unify. We got to get this thing. They just begin to just get united. And because of the Holy Spirit and because of unity, the message of God's kingdom spread and it's still spreading and we are part of that today and we are part of God's work amen that's the church that we're part of that's our heritage because we are a part of a movement that said Holy Spirit do what you want to do and by the way I'm going to love my brother and my brother is going to love me and this is how they will know that we are God's people because we are united together amen unity unity I hope you get this. Listen to me, Lighthouse. The Holy Spirit and unity is all you need in your life. Whatever you're walking through, whatever situation that you're hungry for, whatever you've been praying for, whatever breakthrough that you need in your life, I got the remedy for you. I got the secret sauce I'm about to put on your Chick-fil-A sandwich. I got the secret Chick-fil-A sauce. It's all you need. There is two things that you need. You need to get the Holy Spirit involved in a situation, and you need to get an army united involved in a situation. Amen. In fact, there's no marriage too broken. There's no prodigal too far. There's no work environment too bad. There's no high school student too rough, although we have a couple record breakers. There is no health issue, there is no depression, there is no anxiety, there is not one thing that you brought into this place today that if we can't get the Holy Spirit up in the mix and you can't get an army of believers united with you, that is all you need. Come on, Jesus. Come on, somebody. It's all you need. I just done dipped your whole chicken filet salad sandwich in that secret sauce. I don't know. I must be hungry. I, I was not planning on talking about Chick-fil-A, but it's just coming out of me. Speak, Lord. Somebody once uh, was driving through somewhere that had a Chick-fil-A and brought me a few of them and gave them to me. And I just, res I just say to that prophet, you can do it again if you want. <sighs> now nah, I'm teasing. 
Listen, we've got to seek the Lord, the Holy Spirit, unity. Those are the goals. The, if the goal is breakthrough, then make the new goal, the new target, Holy Spirit and unity. The other goal will take care of itself if we get the Holy Spirit going and we get unity. Amen. It's my desire that we have a church that doesn't just keep breaking through, but we live through. We've had, how many have had a breakthrough season in your life where God has done something great? How many have had, would be honest, and you don't have to raise your hand with this, but how many have had a time in your life where you were praying for something and it broke through and you got a healing or a miracle, but then weeks later, months later, years later, it came back and, and now you are back to where you were before the breakthrough started. You don't have to raise your hand, but this happens. This happens in the church. This happens to believers. I, I was depressed, and I came to the altar, and I got healed, and I had a great three weeks. But then the depression came back. I was, my marriage was good. And we got on the same page. God did an, a, a breakthrough in the altar. Praise the Lord. But six months later, we're back to where we started. I was, I was whole in my body. I had no more back pain. I was set free. I was sleeping good. But then three weeks later, my back hurt me again. And I wasn't sleeping again. Sometimes we have to break through and break through and break through and break through, and break through, and break through. Some, I, sometimes I feel bad for the wrecking ball. You just got to keep breaking through, and breaking through, and breaking through. But I am just praying and believing in my spirit today. I just hear the Holy Spirit saying, today you are going to break through, and not just break through, but live through. If you receive that, will you stand in your place? I'm going to just go rogue for a minute. Will you just lift up your hands all around this room? Father, those who feel like they have just gone through and they've been trying their best to get back to that miracle. They've been trying their best to get back to that breakthrough season. They've been trying their best to get back to that peace level. They've been trying their best, Lord, to get back to that healing. But they just feel like they continually break through and then they're back at it or break through and then they're hurt again or break through and they're depressed again. And Lord, I just declare the prophetic word over them that says today they are not just going to breakthrough they are going to live through in Jesus name amen amen before you're seated come on let's give God a big hand clap hallelujah I want you to find seven people and put your finger in their face and say live through today seven people not six people not three people not two people seven people live through live through you're going to live through today. You're going to live through. You're not just going to break through and go back. You're going to live through. You're going to stay. You're going to stay whole. You're going to stay well. You're going to stay free. You're going to stay free. Woo. Man, I feel God's spirit on this today. Woo. Thank you. You're going to live through. You're going to live through. I am praying and believing that we are going to enter a season of living through. We're going to enter a season of winning battles, of moving God's kingdom down the road, of pushing the ball down the field, of moving forward, not just taking five steps forward and then four steps back and we find ourselves and we just really, we put all this effort, we moved all this ground and we really just got a little bit better. I believe we are going to walk into a divine season of moving big steps. Have you ever played that game, Mother May I? And you got the person over here, and now with my 16 years at kids' ministry, I can pull out games out of nowhere. One of my classics is Mother May I, which I've always felt kind of awkward being the mother. I don't know if that's a good representation or a, something good that we're teaching our kids that I can be a mother during this game. But anyway, I, I'm standing on one side, and the kids are on the other side in a row, and they ask the question, Mother, may I take 42 big steps forward? And I say, no, can't do that. Mother, may I take one step forward? And you just, and you take, Mother, may I take uh, uh, three baby steps forward? Yes, you may. And you take one, two, three. Do you know what I'm talking about? How many are old school and played Mother Maya before? 
The only more dangerous game than that, I don't know how we played this game as kids, Red Rover. Let's take all the little girls on one side and the big mature 14-year-old boys on the other side and let the little girls hold hands and just dare these giant kids to come running at them at full speed. That's a great idea. Whoever made that was just, that must have worked for the ER system or something. I, I was like, let's get all the kids to break their arms at the same time playing the same game. Spe so since I have camp on the game, let's, let's, we get blunder camp games all the time. We, this is off subject, but years ago we had a game they came up with called Trash Heap. And they made this big spray paint circle around the field and all these lines through the middle like a pizza. And then they put these giant 50-gallon trash cans on top of the kids and made them run as fast as they could on their lines. And so they're running. They can't see anything, and they're all running towards the center at the same time. We set a record for, like, 20 concussions all at once. It was like, do, 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 do. I thought the Holy Spirit broke out when I stepped on the field. I was like, man, we got kids slain in the spirit all over the place. Lord, just touch them. Just touch them. And they go, no, Pastor Josh, they're not slain in the spirit. They're slain by trash cans over their heads. I'm like, I was wondering why their little legs are just sticking out of those things. I was. On Mother Maya, you had to ask permission on how far you could move forward. And I just felt like the Lord is just saying, we're about to enter a season. And no, no matter what you ask from the Lord, he is going to give you full permission to move forward as far as you want to go. Amen. As far as you want to move. And oftentimes, because of past hurts or, or past unanswered prayers, we, we prayed for something big and it didn't happen. So we get a little gun shy and we're standing on the edge and Jesus is over there going, you just ask. If you ask anything in my name, if you just ask anything. And we, we because we're gun shy and we've been hurt in the past or we've had breakthrough, but then the thing came back and we just say, uh, 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 Jesus, uh, uh, may I, uh, if, 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 if it pleases you, may I just take one little step forward? Can I just take a little baby step? And Jesus says to us, hey, if it pleases me, it does please me. I want you to be whole. I want you to be free. I want you to walk and run in freedom. I want your life. I want your marriage. I want your kids to be whole. Don't ask me if it pleases me. That's already answered. It does please me. Don't ask for little baby steps. It's time you ask for big running steps. Amen. If the Holy Spirit's in it, if there's an army in unity... It can be done. It's time to live in the breakthrough. It's time to live through. Amen. I want to give you an example of this in Exodus chapter 17. One of my favorite scriptures, although I say that about every Bible story I read. So I think they're all my favorite, to be honest. But Exodus chapter 17, we read a familiar story. It's verse 8. It says, while the people of Israel were still at Rephidim, the warriors of Am Amalek attacked them. Moses commanded Joshua, choose some men to go out and fight the army of Amalek for us. Tomorrow, I will stand on top of the hill, holding the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did what Moses commanded and fought the army of Amalek. Meanwhile, Moses Aaron and her climbed to the top of the nearby hill. As long as Moses held up the staff in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. But whenever he dropped his hand, the Amaleks gave gained the advantage. Moses' arms soon became so tired he could no longer hold them up. So Aaron and her found a stone for him to sit on. Then they stood on each side of Moses, holding up his hands, so his hands held steady until sunset. Come on. As a result, Joshua overwhelmed the army of Amalek in the battle. This account is the example of unity that God is calling our church to step into. We are a church in unity. We have had strong leadership at our core. Our foundation has been built on a strong legacy of unity. Amen. I'm so grateful for pastors 
that have been here for 35 years that did not let disunity go unchecked. When people tried to come and bring strife or division or gossips or rumors or tried to start their own parties or started doing their own thing, we had, praise the Lord, for pastors with a little backbone and a little gut that said, uh, I don't know what you're thinking. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what church you came from in the past. But here at Lighthouse, we are a church of unity. And that type of behavior is unacceptable. Amen. We often get asked how the transition has been going. Maybe you don't know, but in January, Kristen and I became the lead pastors of our church. So the question, when I see my pastor friends, it's always the same. How are things going for you? How's being a lead pastor? Do you like it better than kids? What's the biggest difference between preaching to kids and adults? And I said, there's not really one. I, I've done object lessons. I've done magic tricks. I, I'm pulling out a puppet next week. Bless the Lord. But they ask, how, how is the transition going? And I get to tell you with so much honesty in my spirit, it is going phenomenal. Do you know why? Because we have a church in unity. Amen. We got a church in unity. Why do we have a church in unity? Because we've had pastors who have made it a, a, a staple in their ministry. We have pastors who have done whatever it takes to have the hard conversations with people and to say we are going to be a church that strives for unity no matter what. And because of that, now we get to stand on their shoulders and keep going with that same message. Amen. This is the example that God put on my spirit of unity in the church, of unity at Lighthouse. This is what we strive for. I want to look at this story because here's what we see during this story. Different task, but the one vision. Different task, but one vision. This is the model that God has for his people in God's word. This is what he is believing for. This is the kind of church that Jesus was praying for. They have different tasks, but one vision. Different jobs, but one vision. If you notice in this story, Moses did not fight the battle. He was not in the grounds. Joshua was fighting in the battle. Moses was standing on the hill. Aaron and Hur were now holding a sword. Aaron and her were holding up Moses' arms. They all had one vision. These people came into our territory. They came to attack us. We have got to run them out of here. We have got to win this. They had one vision, different task. One vision, different jobs. Paul said it like this. I'm going to read some scripture to you. It's a lot, but please do not get tired. If you're tired, say, I'm tired. <laughs> I tried. I tried so hard to get you. <laughs> Turn to the person next to you and say, keep going. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 says this. There is one body. Say one body. But it has many parts. But all its many parts make up one body. Say one body. It is the same with Christ. We are all baptized by one spirit. One Holy Spirit. Say one Holy Spirit. And we were all so formed into one body. Say one body. It didn't matter whether we were Jews or Gentiles or, or slaves or free people. We were all given the same spirit to drink. So the body is, is not made up of just one part. It has many parts. If you're sitting next to your spouse, just turn to them and say, I was going to say, say that you like, you like their parts, but that seems weird. Sorry. I don't know if that's appropriate. Well, we had a great lead pastor until today. I'm out. Everybody requires multiple parts. Multiple parts. Suppose that the foot says, I'm not a hand, so I don't belong to the body. By saying this, it cannot stop being part of the body. And suppose the ear says, I'm not and I, so I don't belong to the body. By saying this, it cannot stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, how could you hear? If the whole body were an ear, how could you smell? God has placed each part in the body just as he wanted it to be. 
If all the parts were the same, how could there be a body? As it is, there are many parts, but there's only one body. Say one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you, hand. Get out of here. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you, feet. Get out of here. In fact, it is just the opposite. The parts of the body that seem to be weaker are the ones that we can't go without. The parts that we think are less important, we treat with special honor. The private parts are shown, but they are treated with special care. The parts that can be shown don't need special care. But God has put together all the parts of the body. And he has given more honor to the parts that he didn't have, that didn't have any. And that way, listen to this, the parts of the body will not take sides. The parts of the body will not take sides. All of them will take care of one another. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part shares in its joy. You are the body of Christ. Each one of you is a part of the body. Have you ever stubbed your pinky toe? There is nothing that feels, that I would estimate in my life, that is closer to the pain of hell than when you are walking in the night and you stub your foot or your toe on something. I think the Lord made that part of our world just so we could get a glimpse. So every time you stub your toe, you just ask the Lord to forgive you ever since coming to my life, Lord, just in case. Just, just in case there's secret sin in my heart, Lord, this hurts so bad, I need you, Father. When a part of your body is hurt, even if it's the small pinky toe, your time, your energy, all you can think about is getting that part of your body back and restored. In fact, our, our church has many nurses and doctors and, and people in the medical field. We honor you. We're so grateful for what you do for us. Amen. We're so grateful. You've heard me say this many times. I'll say it again. If there's ever a war that breaks out or something terrible happens, we are all just going to meet here at Lighthouse. We got enough people and enough different occupations. We will be fine forever. We could go. I mean, we have people that can fix things and weld things. And we got dentists and, and we got doctors and we got nurses and we got plumbers and we got landscapers. We got, we got it all. We would just, I think we would thrive, to be honest. I think we would thrive. Anyway, those doctors in the ER, those nurses in the ER, when somebody comes in and there's a part in their body that is hurting, they don't go, uh, doctor, I have some stomach pain, uh, but also I got some gray hair. Uh, could you uh, dye that for me while you're at it? Or doctor, uh, I cut my hand really bad. Could you fix that? And while you're at it, doctor, uh, I, I got some I got some warts down here that need looked at or or when somebody hurts themselves and cuts themselves really bad they don't go in and just say hey doctor can you fix this part but but while you're at it will you go ahead and clip my toenails down there while you're at it they, they don't care about they don't care about the cosmetics of the thing whatever is hurting that is what needs fixed that is what they're concerned about how many have ever been in so much pain you showed at the ER that way I know my mama did this earlier this year. You know the story. She had some, some things happen internally, and, and she had to get to the doctor, and she didn't care what, what outfit she had on. She didn't care what her hair looked like. She had one thought. There is a part of my body that is not working correctly. I got to get this thing fixed. And Paul is saying the same thing. When there is one part in the body of Christ that is in pain, all other parts suffer. This is why it breaks my heart. Can I be real with you really quick? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to coach you up really quick, can I? It breaks my heart when I see somebody with boldness and courage. I know how much boldness and courage it takes. Sometimes walking these 40 feet seems like walking 40 miles. And when I see somebody walk to this altar and they come up here for prayer or they kneel down, and there is not an immediate prayer partner, somebody with them, to put their hand on their shoulder and to pray with them. It breaks my heart because I see a wounded part of the body 
that is looking to be restored. And if that person does not get restored, the entire body will suffer. Can we just, since I'm making things a thing today, made the thing about the kids' team a thing, I'm going to make another thing. Nobody prays at the altar alone from now on. Can we just make that a thing? Are we in unity about that? Can we make that a thing? If you're serving the Lord and you're right with God and you don't have secret sin, you're not acting one way or the other way, you're not acting like everything's fine here at church and then you're living a sinful life, then you are deputized to pray for people when they come. Get up here and pray for them. We are a church in unity. If one person is hurting, we are all going to suffer. we got to get that person whole. Amen? This is what Paul is saying. He's saying we've got to look at our church like the body of Christ because that's what it is. Not each party has the, not each uh, part of the body has the same task or job, but they are part of the same body. The fingers don't do the same thing that the nose does. The nose, I'm not that medically uh, uh, aware, but I do know that the ear and the nose do different things. Some of you are impressed. I know that much. We were praying for somebody the other day, and that the prayer was they need an organ in their body. I don't remember what it was. They need that organ in their body to begin to work right. And we were kind of, some of us were standing around, and they go, what does that even do? And we were like, I don't know. I guess it's an important part, but let's pray that it gets better. I don't know. It's like a spleen or a pancreas or a something. I don't know what it was. I don't know what it does, but they say you need it. So let's pray it gets better. <laughs> those in the medical field <laughs> you gotta bear with me <laughs> it's like pastor this this person's pancreas needs uh needs prayed for and i'm like okay where do i place my hand <laughs> uh, lord help me lord help me when one part of the body suffers we all suffer parts of the body do different things but they're all part of one body. So when we see this story in Exodus uh, of this army that's winning this fight, here's what we see. Different task, one vision. I want to give you three tasks that we see, and then we're going to pray. Number one, uh, here's the task that we need to accomplish unity. Here's what the army needs. When your breakthrough requires an army, here's what you need. Number one, you need Moses on the hill, the task of prayer. you got to have somebody praying we got to be people of prayer. It always comes back to prayer. It always comes back to being people of prayer. Let me just remind you, church, we started this year. Before we got to greater unity, we started with greater prayer. Then we got to greater vision, and now we're at greater unity. It's got to start with prayer. you got to get people praying. If you're walking through something, here's what I want to encourage you. you got to get people praying. Can I just tell you how frustrating it is as a pastor when somebody comes and goes, hey, Pastor, um, I'm going to ask for you to pray for something. And I go, okay, what's going on? And they go, well, I've had this uh, back, back pain I've been praying for. Would you agree with me in prayer? And I go, okay, well, how long has the back pain been going? And they go, oh, well, just like 10 years. I'm like, why, have, why did you not tell me this 10 years ago? And why are we just now getting prayer warriors on this thing? If something is hurting, we got to get people praying. Amen. If your marriage is hurting, I know it's hard. I know it's embarrassing. If you are, if you're stuck, if you got a kid that's doing silly things, I know it's rough. You don't want to, you don't want to embarrass them. You don't want to call them out. You don't want to bring all the secret stuff out in their life. I'm not talking about embarrassing people. I'm not talking about going on Facebook and saying, you know, can you pray for me and my husband? Uh, first of all, Facebook is not the place to ask for prayer requests. Can I just say that? No, I'm talking about going to people that you can have confidence in, that they're not going to go blab to everybody else. But when they get up in the morning, they're up before you, and you wake up in the morning, and your eyes wake up, and you can start thinking, you know what, this person has already been up for 30 minutes praying for me. Those pastors have, oh, I've been sleeping here. I slept in today. But, man, those pastors, they've been awake praying for me this morning. I'm talking about getting the prayer warriors in your life on the task of prayer. That's what I'm talking about. Are we in agreement? Say amen. We've got to get people praying. 
I know it's hard. It's embarrassing to say, this is what we're walking through. This is what my kid did. This is what my body's doing. This is how I'm hurt. Some of us men are so proud. Let me just tell you, the kingdom of God is not made for proud people. It's because it's a kingdom. And when you get into a kingdom, the proudness gets taken away because you go, there's one king in charge. And I'm not that guy. That's why it's a kingdom. And so some of you men, you've been trying to get free about things in your life. You've been trying to win. You've been trying to do the right things. You've been, your marriage, you've been trying. You've been praying for those kids. You've been praying for your body. You've been praying for that addiction. And it takes a lot of pride. I understand, friend. I've been there. It takes a lot to come to somebody and say, hey, I haven't told anybody this, but I need breakthrough about this. I need a prayer warrior to lock arms with me and pray with this with me. I know it takes a lot, but the reason you have not got breakthrough or the reason you got breakthrough and now you're back in your mess is because you did not get an army of prayer warriors praying for you. It's time, friend. The first task is the task of prayer. We got to get people praying. Tyler, begin to move. Let's have the rest of the worship team hold off just for a minute. We've got to get people praying. Your church wants to pray for you. You got friends here, women's and men's groups on Wednesday nights. This is why it's important. All the women say amen. All the men say amen. Yeah. I love it. This is why it's important. Because something happens when you come into a group and you sit in a circle and go, this is what I need prayer about. And you got men of God who want to join you in prayer. It's important. We got to get people praying. Moses' task was not to be in their fighting. Moses' task was not to be in the mix. Moses' task was a task of prayer. We got to have people praying. Here's the test, uh, second task that your army needs. You need Moses on the hill. You need the task of prayer. Number two, you need Aaron and her holding up Moses' hands. This is the task of support. Moses was doing the prayer thing but he needed support. This is why, men, we got to get rid of our pride and ask for support. I've been trying to break through. I've been trying not to just break through. I've been trying to live through. I've been trying to make a difference. I've been trying to be the man of God I'm called to be. I've been trying to live at peace with my wife or in our home. I've been trying to be the right father. I, I, I've been trying to be the right boss. I've been trying so hard to be the right coworker. And I've been praying for it. But it's not just prayer. It's also support. Prayer is powerful. Listen to me, church. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is powerful. Amen. But support is so powerful as well. I'm not saying don't pray and just ask for people to help you. No, I'm saying you need both. You got Moses praying. You got Aaron and her with the task of support. You've got to have that. Hey, I know you, Lighthouse, you are amazing at the support of your pastors. And I just got to tell you, thank you. We feel so supported. Kristen and I and our kids, your legacy pastors, Pastor Connor and Kaylee, we feel so loved and supported. We feel so loved and supported. But let me just be real practical and honest with you. When we got spots in the nursery to fill, we got spots with the kids' teams, or we need bus drivers, or we need Sunday school teachers. We need ushers. We need impact team. We got great people in all of these ministries. But unless we can get the support built up to withhold more, God is not going to bring more. I have this conversation with our kids' team all the time. Why don't we have 300 kids? Why do we only have 200? Why don't we have 300? Well, I'll tell you why. Because we can't handle 300. Because if 100 more showed up this Sunday, the walls would break, there would be fires, and the police would have to be called. The reason why our church is the size that we are is because we're not ready to handle more. So what do we have to do? We've got to get ready to handle more. We need more support. This is why Next Steps class is so important. It is not about getting you plugged in and doing a job so that we can check that box off. It is because when you are doing a part of God's kingdom, 
that you are passionate about, that you care about. It draws you, you become closer to Jesus. Come on. You are closer to Jesus when you are locked in and doing the work of Jesus with Jesus. I'm not saying working for Jesus without him. I'm saying me and God are walking hand in hand and we are ministering, ministering to these kids together. We are greeting people together. We are worshiping together. We are playing instruments together. When your passion connects with the heart of God and the kingdom of God, God will use you for something great. We need more support. We got to bump up the support. For all of you that did not start the year doing any kind of ministry, but now you're serving in some capacity, you're part of the impact, you're on the worship team, I just got to tell you, holy cow, I'm so proud of you. Wow, thank you. Thank you for jumping on the team. I appreciate you. I see what you're doing. I see how you've stepped up. I've seen how you're working. Thank you so much. For those of you, you've been serving in this church for years. Some of you have been serving longer than me, and that's a long time. Thank you. Your support of our church and ministry here means everything. This is why tithing is important. It, this is why tithing is important. Because it goes, God, when I put you first in my finances, then you are first in everything else in my life. If tithing is important, our church is going to be fine. Our church is, our church is going to be fine. God is going to provide. Tithing is not to meet the needs of the church. Tithing is to put you in right standing with the Lord. That's what it's for. That's what it's for. We put God first in our tithing. We put God per first in our finances. Everything else is going to be fine. It's his work. The rest of the worship team now, if you'll join me. Nobody else leaving. Let me give you the third one. Moses on the hill, task of prayer. Aaron and her holding up Moses' hands, the task of support. And then Joshua in the fight, fighting the task of action. The task of action. This is what I'm talking about. It's time for action to take place. It's time for movement. You know, there's times in Scripture, there's just a handful of times, but I'll give you a time in Scripture. God says the words, listen to this. It's going to shock some of you. You're not going to believe me. But you can go back and, and then text me later and say you were right. I'll, I'll take those tests, uh, texts all day long. Bless the Lord. <laughs> I saved those on my phone. I screenshot anytime somebody text, text me, you were right and I was wrong. I just saved that and just say, thank you, Lord. And then I just wake up every morning and read. I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. No, it doesn't happen. Uh, Moses is standing at the edge of the Red Sea. Pharaoh and the armies behind him. All of God's people trying to survive. And he's praying. And God looks down at him and says, stop praying. What? Yeah, God said, stop praying and move. Go forward. Stop praying. Start walking. Now, do we stop praying? No, no, pray without ceasing. But we can't just sit there and pray. We've got to have some action. It wasn't, the, and there are circumstances in God's word, aren't there, where God fights to fight for the people. God does a miracle. I think, I think about the story where, where they get confused and they kill each other off. Or when, when uh, Pharaoh's army gets drowned in the sea. But more often than that, God says, we need somebody praying. We need somebody supporting. But then I also need you to fight. I need people fighting. In this story, God didn't say Moses and Joshua and Aaron and all the people are going to stand at the top of the hill and then the armies are just going to fight each other. No, no. Somebody's got to get down in the valley and somebody's got to fight. And church, I will say to you, your faith requires action. Faith without works is dead. Your faith requires action. If you are working and you are pushing and you need a breakthrough in your life, whatever area it is, let me give you the remedy again. Number one, you got to get an army of people praying. 
Number two, you get an army of people supporting. And number three, you got to get an army of people fighting and taking action. Our faith, our breakthrough, our peace, our hope, our joy, our wholeness requires an army. God can do all things. God can heal the sick. God is delivering people. I'm hearing it all the time that God is doing great things in this ministry, in this church. But God is using the army called Lighthouse to make a difference. The more unified we are, the more difference we make. We are stepping into a season of greater unity. If you are with me, will you stand to your feet all over this room? Every man, woman, young man, young woman, child, if you're in the room, we're going to begin to go after Jesus together. It's time we gather as an army. It's time we gather as an army. It's time we're united. Amen. I'm not saying we're not. We are a unified church. But I'm praying for greater unity. Here's what this looks like today. Feel somebody, two or three people putting their hands on your shoulders. And Pastor, hold them in. Pastor Kathy, myself, we're going to come and we're just going to anoint you in oil like it says in James to do. And as we pray for you, you're going to feel the army of the Lord come and join hands with you and fight with you. And you're going to receive your breakthrough and not just receive breakthrough. You're going to live your breakthrough out. Are you tracking with me? Are we united in this? Here's, here's what's hard. I understand this. Some of us have medical issues. It's hard for us to stand. It's hard for us to walk forward. I understand that. What I would encourage you to do is just come forward and sit on the front row with us. Just sit in the front, lift up your hands, or, or maybe you have to, maybe for some reason you can't walk. Not that you don't want to. Not that you just, you just don't feel like going to the front. I'm talking about you have a medical issue. You can't walk forward. Just extend your hand and pray for us as we're up here fighting. We got to have people praying. We got to have support. And we got to have somebody doing the action. Amen. My prayer, I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot, but my prayer is that we would be united in prayer for each other. Can we lift up our hands all over this room? First of all, let's just pray that the Lord would check our heart. God, is there pride that keeps me from praying for others? Some of us here, Lord, we feel like we're walking through our own thing, so it makes it hard for us to pray for others. I understand that. But, Lord, you're calling us to be like the early church, to be united, to walk in unity with each other, to lift up each other's burdens, to pray for each other, to support each other, to take action with each other. You're calling us to be the church of God. You're calling us to be with one vision, and not thy vision, one vision. So I pray that today you would help us. With our heads so bowed and our eyes so closed, if you're here and you do need a breakthrough in some area, your kids, your family, your home, your workplace, there's an area of your life that you need a breakthrough. If that's you, will you lift up your hand all over this place? You're just going to identify yourself with me. Amen. Here's what you're going to do. You don't have to be embarrassed or ashamed. Even if you have ministry to do, just stay and get your breakthrough. You don't have to be embarrassed or ashamed. We've all been there. You are going to feel the support of the Army of Lighthouse coming behind you and praying for you. So if that's you, your hands lifted, and you need breakthrough in an area, I'm going to give you about a 15-second head start, and then the rest of the Army is coming. So you got 15 seconds to get up here to the front, line up with your feet on this green line all over the front of this room. you got 15 seconds. If you need breakthrough, get up here right now. Stay standing because you're going to feel the support of your church come behind you and lift you up and pray for you.